Okay, everybody. So on today's show, I've got, uh, you know, not all things Cal look come from Southern California. <laughs> a lot of things that are Cal look enthusiasts, Cal look or, or originators, people have been in the hobby. They all moved all over the place. And the gentleman I have on today's podcast is an original Cal look guy that's been in the hobby for a very long time. And you may, if you've ever been to the Phoenix Bugarama, you may know about this gentleman today. On today's show, I've got Rick Mortensen, and he's been involved in the VW scene for over 40 years. And he's been an active participant in keeping and promoting the scene, especially in the Phoenix area. But he's got origins in Southern California. You may remember his car was in the Cal Look issue in the 1996 February issue of Hot VW. So... Rick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. So the way we always start the podcast is, what's your VW story and how did you get into Volkswagens? That, it's a fun story and I know everybody's got one. <clears throat> when, I, uh, when I was in high school, and I have to preface how I got into them, was all my buddies had Chevys, 56 Nomads, 57 Chevys, 55 Chevys. So I thought, well, that's the car I'm going to have. And uh, one of the gals I knew in high school, Pam Castle, had this pristine 56, never been touched. Um, and I just said, okay, and I bought it from her. And shortly after that, I was cruising down the road in Fair Oaks, California, where I lived, and uh, pulled up to a stoplight, and this little bug pulled up next to me with a sunroof. It's probably in mid-60s. It was an earlier small window. And um, the light turns green, and he takes off. Well, I go to take off, and I realize I've got my car floored, and I'm not catching him. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, well, that was a fluke. He just got the jump on me. So at the next stoplight, we went a couple miles. Uh, I hear him rev it up this time because he sees me pulled up next to him, and he takes off, and he just smoked me. He was gone and so far. I thought, well, it was too good to be true. So I followed this little bug for about two miles into Orangeville, California, which is a couple miles where I live in Fair Oaks, and pulled in behind him, and he pulled into this, like, commercial strip center like you'd have all a bunch of shops and machine shops and stuff yeah. and in the center of it was this big sign on the end that said der wagon shop and i thought well this is gonna get interesting so i get out and he's kind of wondering why i'm following him he's probably my age at the time he's probably 65 70 and uh i get out and i go he goes can i help you and i was sure i mean i'm just curious what you got in this thing and it, it's so fast so he opens the deck lid and right before my eyes is this giant 48 IDA topped motor. I didn't know the size at the time. I said, well, what, how big is this? I didn't know anything about Volkswagens. He goes, well, it's a 2180, which back then, I guess you could, you could buy the kits. This, and he told me it was a SCAD engine. Um, he built it. He also, he, I later find out he did gearboxes and everything. So I said, well, come on in, see what I do. Takes me in the shop and this place is filled with sand rails and buggies with, you know, dual carb motors and paddle tires and everything. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And he actually introduced me into a whole new world. I mean, yeah. I thought, this is so cool. I've got to have one of these. And it, it wasn't too long after that I sold my Chevy. I didn't have it that long and started looking for a bug. And so I was in downtown, I guess Carmi Carmichael was between where I lived in Sacramento and saw this little red 66 bug sitting on a car lot, walked in to see what he wanted for it. And the guy wanted 800 bucks and uh, had chrome Porsche wheels on it. Uh, beyond that, I think we had a f oil pressure gauge and a fancy steering wheel, and that was it. Just pretty stock looking otherwise. And so I ended up buying that car for $800, and uh, it kind of all ballooned from there. You know? yeah. then, I, then I found out you could buy parts for them, and uh, there was a shop in Sacramento called Victory Auto that sold exhausts and Bosch 010 distributors and all kinds of things. So. I soon had a different exhaust on it, a distributor, and it wasn't long after that I blew the engine up. I sucked a valve and right through the number three cylinder. When I when I spread it all out in my mother's garage, there was a valve sticking right in the top of the number three piston. Oh wow! And uh, so you over revved it pretty good. Oh yeah, I I wet revved it way beyond where it should have been. You know, single springs and everything. So. And now, were you a fairly mechanical guy Not back at all. then? Not at all. I had never. I took metal shop in high school, and I, I love metal fabrication, still do it this, to this day, but never touched one. But uh, af after a short period of time, my mother was sick of seeing it all over the garage floor, so she had a Renault she took to a foreign car shop in Citrus Heights near where we lived, 
and she begged this guy who was a mechanic to come home and help me. And yeah. that's where the whole evolution from a stock 1300 to these big giant motors and everything began. So. And now you're living where at this time? We're in a little town called Whitman. It's about 30 miles northwest of Phoenix. Okay, so you were living in Phoenix at this time. No, I, actually at that time I was living in Northern California. Okay, so yep. you're living in Northern California. Yep. And the shop that was helping you, what's that guy's name? Uh, Don Ward. Don and Ward. That was the guy who introduced me to him. And then Mike Lowerman worked at a shop called uh, Sunrise Automotive. Mm-hmm. It was on Sunrise Boulevard in Citrus Heights. And uh, little did I know what meeting him would end up happening. Yeah. And so you get this first bug. What year is it? It's a 60, 66. 66 Beetle. 1300 in it. And that's the motor you grenade. Now, when you re, when you go for the rebuild, what do you put back in it? Well, Mike told me. He came over and assessed my parts all over the place. And he says, uh, did you know you can uh, we can make this bigger? You know, which is what he did. He was a factory trained Porsche mechanic. And uh, he worked on all their 356s, 911s, everything Porsche in this shop. And I said, okay. So he pointed me to a shop in, in uh, Sacramento called Victory Auto, which was near another story we'll talk about. And um, he says, well, what do you want to do? I says, well, I, let's make it as big as we can. So we bought, I ended up uh, buying a 74 millimeter cir- circular balance crank. It was a cast crank ma- made by Butt Whitfield from Victory Auto. Yeah. And they don't, you know, cast, I didn't know anything about cast and forge. So. Uh, we modif- he helped me modify the VW rods for the stroke, and then we bought MPR 92s from Dino Dinosaurs, which was in Southern California, which I, that's the first encounter I had with them, which I found my original receipt of really? the parts I bought from them in 1971, 72. Now, did you drive there to get the cylinders, or you had yeah, them? Yeah, well, my family all lived down there, so every time we took a trip to Southern California, like Santa Ana, Orange. You brought a shopping list. Yeah, I got stuff while I was down there, so... So you built. So you end up building. What's it, the? It was ninety-two by seventy-four. So it was a nineteen sixty-eight cc engine. So I nice. went from thirteen hundred to almost two. And meter. now you got big power. Now, yeah. now, and this time when you're running around on those, you're saying this is seventy seventy-one. Is there? So you build this hopped up bug. Is there spots where you guys can go street race or drag strip well, or really? Kind of the stuff? only thing then Sacramento Raceway had just opened. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting story there is the guy, Dave Smith, that owns Sacramento Raceway, also mm-hmm. owned Cascade Fence Company, which a lot of my high school friends work for the guy. He was another member, and he hired them all. And then he bought Sacramento Raceway, and he's owned it until they just sold it. Really? Um, but, yeah, we take him out there and bracket race them. So. And what was that? you remember what that car ran on that, uh, that the 1960? The best I ever ran with that was a 1620, because when I first built it, it had a two-barrel on it. And, I, and that was with the help of some close ratio gears because the same Don Ward, the, the wagon shop, I found out he did gearboxes. So that car, in addition to me building, I didn't build it, Mike Lowerman built the first motor. Uh, I got Don Ward to build me a gearbox and that made all the difference. But couldn't drive it on the freeway very well, but it was yeah. really tight geared. But Yeah, I think you do a, a tight gearbox one time for the street yeah. and then, and then after that. Again. Yeah. <laughs> or you go 388 and go to a five speed or something. So. Right, right. So... Now you're you're now you relocate out of Northern California at this well, point. Well, I lived or in Northern you... California from '66 to '80, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of history transpired from, during that period up there. Um, I went to high school up there, graduated in '70. Um, that same year that I met Mike Lowerman, I was looking for somebody to do the machine work mm-hmm. on my, and somehow some somebody at this Victory Auto and where I bought my first parts. Nilo Volkswagen was right next door to him. Oh, really? And lo and behold, Ray Valero, who's well known in the early days, um, worked for them as the line mechanic. And Ray was probably the most talented machinist, welder, fabricator I'd met. Um, he probably had about 10 years on me. But um, so they they said, well, why don't you go over here and talk to this guy, Ray Valero at Nilo? And I go over and introduce myself. Don't have a clue who he is. And Say, does Ray Valero work here? And they go, yep. He come, little guy comes walking out, little Italian-looking guy. And how you doing? And tell him what I'm doing. Well, he got all excited up and happy because there's another VW guy. Right. Little did I know, he had just been in the final stages of building his first H gas car. Mm-hmm. It was called Bug Iron. And it was a typical car of the day. Didn't get a lot of ink because he's in Northern California. But it was a 57 oval aluminum floor pan, tube axle, 2180 Hillborn injected H gas car. 
and it was sitting in the showroom at Nilo Volkswagen. And once I saw that, it was like phase two of the me going losing my marbles right. about high performance Volkswagens. And so a friendship started with him. The whole time I lived there from you know the late sixties to eighty when I moved to Phoenix, Ray did all my machine work. Um, so he was like, it was like a great alliance to meet oh, that yeah. guy and just have him another stepping stone. Mike kind of weaned me on on the high performance and Ray kind of took it a notch higher on clearancing all the parts and the how to build the engine and everything. So and Ray had a very uh he was quite an innovator. He had he built a Porsche 912 drag car. Yeah. Uh, which I have, and a lot of people don't realize that I'm the one that has it now. But oh, you have you ha so you have the Valero's drag car, yeah, huh? That says Valero on the side of it. It's at my place, and my intention is when I get a little more organized, get my shop finished up, I'm going to start working on it. So. And what that what did that car run for motor? Uh, he ran an 1140s, but it was uh, he ran a small motor. It was a 94 by stock stroke. Had aluminum rods, okay, and nobody was running aluminum rods. So 1914. Yep, yep. And ran 11s in a 912, like a steel body 912. Yep. Yeah, but it was an all tube chassis car. Right. There's nothing 912 about it other than the body. Okay. Um, it has a fiberglass trans front end, fiberglass doors. Um, all the windows were Lexan. The main shell was the only part that was left that was steel, but everything was tube axle. Tube, tube chassis and it's a really heavy tube chassis it was built out of two by three inch box tubing on the oh, main wow. frame yeah so it needs a lot of work to be lightened up so pretty stuff how'd you end up with that car well don who was a close friend of his um lived up in grass valley area uh, auburn area um everybody talked about the car went to france a french guy owned it for a while that has an import export business in france what is his name i wish i could recall his name right now anyway they, the car went to France for a while, mm -hmm. and then Don decides she's going to bring it back and surprise Ray because this was his first really cool, probably major drag car he built out of a Volkswagen. And uh, so we had an open house up in uh, at Tony Klink's shop in Auburn. Yeah. And Tony's a BW dragger. Yeah. So, but he also is a very skilled, talented Subaru mechanic. And so uh, the car was transported up there. I drove my chop top from Phoenix all the way to Sacramento, dual 48s and all. Really? And uh, Bob Hole went up there. A bunch of guys, notables, went up there to, to unveil this car to Ray. We had pictures of that. I wish I'd have brought them. And it, it kind of, and I brought tears to his eyes. He hadn't seen the car probably for 15 years. Uh, unfortunately, after Ray got the car within a year, uh, he had a massive heart attack in his shop and died. Mm. And uh, so Don called me. Uh, the kids, for some reason, didn't want the car at the time. Linda didn't want it. She was married. Her husband definitely didn't want it. Little Ray was uh, working at a Ford dealer, I think. He ended up moving to Idaho. Nobody wanted it, so Don says, well, you're the only other one that was around when he built it. She goes, how would you like the car? So I ended up with it. So That's crazy. Yeah, so it went, it's like 40 years full circle, and here I am back, and I've got the original pictures of it in primer and it had a flip top body the front tip tilted up the body tilted up it was a pretty cool car so and so now you you're you're in the hobby you meet these guys and you start to go to the buggeramas and all that stuff that are happening up there in sacramento well, the sacramento buggerama didn't start up till around 77 um and i actually i i had built my white cowlick car which you have a picture of i think i'm standing in front of it that was in a park in Fair Oaks. Um, I was one of the few guys in Northern California that was doing the cow look thing. There was a little handful of us, not very many of us. Um, and now the cow look car is not your. That's not your second car. That's that was about my third car. Your second my, car. My first car was a was a '66 uh, bug that I bought. Right. <laughs> we redid it. We painted it competition orange. It was like a cop mm -hmm. magnet. It had. Uh, like the early DKP cars, I had five spoke American mags on it and flared fenders. And, you know, it was long before the cow look scene. And I right. drove, the, drove because, that car everywhere. Because that was that was the next level of the scene that was there, right? Was right. like the whole, uh, for for lack of a better term, the whole auto house sticker right. look. Like the, exactly. the flared lip fenders, the wide ants and slot mags. Yep. The fiberglass hood. If you saw that little auto husk car face on with the, yeah. with the depressed deck lid. As a matter of fact, I just sold, uh, or I traded away to Rick Stanchfield, another BW drag racer. Yeah. Uh, 
my last piece of early nostalgia, one of those auto house hoods for the tough enough car, which he's restoring. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it was the early look. Everybody was doing it. Uh, the only thing that the cow look really evolved from the drag race look. I mean, if truth be known about the whole cow look, it was really just a street legal version of what the drag bugs used to look like. Yeah. All stripped down and de-chromed and, um, but that didn't truly evolve until about the 74, 75. And then all of a sudden Hot VWs did an article, but it, it was evolving into that in the mid seventies. Right. So. I mean, I mean, ultimately to be a street legal drag car, you, you had to have tires inside the fender. Well, you didn't want big wide tires. You want right. skinny tires. So it's an evolution. It's an evolution of a look. And, and what's interesting is Burley Burlisle is the guy that did the diagram on it. And he's been on the podcast a few times. Yep, I know Burley. And, um, you know, he could have put anything he want in those pictures because there was multiple levels of cow looks. Like a lot of guys, you know, if people fail to realize like when you're back there in 73, 74, it was cooler if you had a 68. Yeah. Because 68 had, you, you could do the disc brakes from the Gia on it. You could do four lug. You had more wheel options. You know what I mean? Like yep. as, a, as a guy in the cow look, you know, you had the eight spokes and, so many people, because you look at the early, I forget the um, the owner of the green uh, split window that's on the cover of VW Trends. Um, I think it was Mark um, Maffey that had uh, Maffey, yeah. uh, Mike Maffey that had yep. the, the green split window, but that was on four lug. It was on four lug uh, gold eight spokes. And right. so back in those days, that was kind of, that was part of the cool part it of the cow look. It was, you know, the whole premise behind it was, the premise of modifying your cars back in the early days was trying to update your car as modern as you could make it type thing. You know what I mean? Yep. Within the parameters of what you were doing and the cow look stuff kind of stayed frozen into a, a, an era of where it's at. And it, it became after what became kind of a traditional look, you know? <clears throat> now, as you go on to do, um, as you go on with uh, your hobby now and you've got your cow look bug that we're talking about, what um you've got some pictures you sent me here of you in it in front of auto house yes or what with you with your bug in front of auto house that now. was in the uh around 77 mm -hmm. um we used to drive down to visit my mother-in-law she lived in santa Ana, and every time i went down obviously i had to do the shop tours so um it's funny um doug Meesh, who's also an early mm -hmm. i think a dkp2 guy yeah um he actually worked, I believe, at the Costa Mesa shop. So, um, but there was a lot of guys I ran into later, and he had a really fast Gia. He had a kind of a pale yellow Gia with that Porsche alloys on it, giant motor. Um, so he worked at that shop, and then the orange shop I used to go to a lot. I don't remember all the guys that worked there, but um, I frequented those and Riddle Machine, Remco, yeah. and um, DDS. At one time, I almost bought the DDS drag car. I don't know if you remember the old chop top, white, purple, uh, yeah. purple highlights on it and orange highlights. Uh, from 68 to 72, I think it was around 72, 73, DDS was slowing down, and Paul Schley would know all the numbers better than me. But um, And Dean was selling that drag car with a five-speed in it. And I went down to look at it, and he wanted $2,500 for that drag bug. But $2,500 in 1972 oh, yeah. might have been $25,000. No, it was, you know? it was a substantial amount of money. Um, and I wanted that car so bad. I was trying to figure out a way to buy that car, but it, it just wasn't in the cards. So Yeah, there's a lot of those cars that kind of slipped through the cracks. And, and luckily, Russell's picked up so many of those cars up yep. in, uh, up, up in uh, Scotland that it's just... It's crazy to think of, you know, because what, what's funny, even if you go back to the original Shelby, right? Carol Shelby sold one of the original race cars for like 500 bucks to one of yeah. the guys like, you want this thing? 500 bucks because it's last year's race car. Yeah. And we're all about cutting edge and the next thing. And and there's just so much, so much that doesn't happen at the time when you're looking at it that happens. And you think like, oh, what a great deal. But at the time, it's like, who wants last year's race car? Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, it, it, it's wild how that happens. Now this particular, so the the bug that you build, this is the one. Uh, your, it is the sixty six. What the white car is? What year? That was a sixty seven. Okay. Yeah, I, I moved. I like the look. I like the early style headlights a lot, but the sixty seven was the one year only with the you know straight up headlights right. and had a different deck lid, a little bit more room in the engine compartment, um, 
And for some reason, I landed on that. All my buddies were buying 67s, so that just seemed like the choice that was going to be in the next round. So. And now you, this car, you you did a bunch of mods to this car. That you. car was modified heavily. Front end, we did the lowering treatment on it. Um, it had a close ratio gearbox, but I did not put a close fourth in it. Had a stock fourth gear. Um, uh, I did have a 412 ring and pinion on it, so it could be somewhat more drivable. And uh, but the interior was what really set that car apart. Right. The interior of this car was a plaid Herculon headliner, inserts on the seats and door panels, and I made a custom dash. I made a metal template first, and then I. Um, cut the whole dash out, and I found gauges from an Opel GT. I don't know if you guys remember. They look yep. like a little miniature Corvette. Right. Um, and they were. I went to the wrecking yard, and they were all VDO. And I thought, well, this will be easy. I just went and bought the sending units, and had all the VDO gauges from that Opel GT working in my. It was unique. Nobody else could. could they'd have to buy VDO gauges, but nobody had one like that one. Right. Uh, put a stereo in it, and then I had these fiberglass seat cells, seat shells that we upholstered along with the back seats, but. Uh, people would look inside that car and go, <laughs> you know, a lot going on. Yeah, there was a, lot a lot going on lot with that happened. with that plaid. Yeah, but you know that that was the that was the look back in the day, yeah. right? Was the plaid, the plaid something inserts. to yeah. something to be a little bit loud. So you have this car for how long? Do you have this car? You know, I, I was a newly married, had a young daughter, uh, our first child, and um, I was trying to. I think this is right before. No, this is after we bought the house. So. We were just trying to get ahead. I was trying to build a shop on the back of the house in Fair Oaks, which I eventually did. Uh, so and Fair Oaks is northern California still? or something? Yeah, it's just east of Sacramento, on, okay. off Highway 50 on the way to Lake Tahoe, out, out near Folsom Lake. So really pretty place. Um, anyway, so we decided to drive it down to Bug-In 22. And I'll never forget because I was on the front row of the car show right at the, would have been the north end of the pit side bleachers. And some young kid from Torrance, California came up and had to have it. And... So it's me and my wife and our barely one-year-old child that mm -hmm. we had driven down there with. And we were going to have to fly home. There was no way to get home. So he bought the car. He and his dad drove us to the airport, and we bought some tickets and flew home. What would you sell the car for? Oh, it was a ridiculous price at the time. Uh, I don't think he paid more than $3,000 for it. Yeah, so, that's crazy. Yeah, and the flu I mean, now... And the flu yeah, but you're thinking, man, I really cut a fat hog on yeah, this thing. I mean, look yeah. at the. <laughs> I mean, I only paid five hundred for the cars. And this is how you get rich. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we all go through that in our younger days. Like, there's a, a sum of money. Like, man, I've never, I've never had three thousand dollars in yeah. my hand at once. I mean, it would be nice just to sell that. I'll build another one. I built this one. It's super easy. You yeah. Know, you kind of go through that whole thing in your head. Well, you put everything in perspective. Our first house only cost twenty five thousand. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's was... that's one one fifth of what that. Uh, what that house would cost. Yeah. So now you sell this car. Now you're out of a car. What do you do? Well, I built another. So auto you had a car waiting in the wings? Yeah, I've always had way too many cars. Uh, so I built another car. Um, and in between that, no, you know, we missed a car right bef in this late 70s after I did my first couple of chop tops. I had a 67. And that car got totaled in a really bad accident. And I don't have any pictures of that because there's nothing to take pictures of at the time. And um, so that was probably my last Volkswagen. I didn't build another Volkswagen until I got married. So there was kind of a gap from 74 to 76, 77. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I, I landed on 67s. And then after I sold the white 67, I bought Ray Valero's bug iron drag car body. I wish I had pictures of that. Oh, one. you bought the body? Pull that mic a little closer to you. Just the microphone. Yeah, there oh. you go. And um, the goal was to, I was going to try to, at the time, uh, put it back as a drag car, but as a newlywed, that was probably pie in the sky. A bad idea? Yeah, it wasn't a real good idea. So I ended up selling the car body. I don't even remember who I sold it to. And I started, I finished my shop, and I started doing a lot of metal work. Um, I had a uh, chopped Carmen Ghia that I had aluminum doors on, did a lot of work on that um, I sold to a guy from Bug Formance named Don Richardson, and I don't know where that car ended up today, but it looked like a Bonneville car. Uh, after that car, um, I had a 56 ragtop oval window and another 67, and I chopped that 67, and a club in Sacramento bought it from me. And A uh, club bought it from a you? A VW club, because I got this opportunity to move to Phoenix, in around 1980 and uh, so I'm just 
unloading all these extra cars so I can move to Phoenix. And so we moved to Phoenix and it wasn't till about, oh gosh, I didn't do a lot of Volkswagen stuff between about 78, 79 and 82. Um, got situated in Phoenix and I went to the last bug in at OCIR in 1983 with a friend who was in the fall of 83. And on the way back, we started thinking, man, we, what's going to happen without the bug ins? You know, it was the only big event on the West Coast. Right. And um, how big was the bug in when you'd go to that? Oh, it was huge. I, I, I have no doubt there must, there was probably 500 plus cars between the car show, drag racing swap meet and everything else slalom they had slalom at the north end of the track at ocir on the uh, west side of the top shutdown area of the drag strip um i would say he had eight to ten thousand people crowds at that event i mean those stands were and packed you're saying this is 83 and you 18. would drive out from phoenix to yep. go to the and how did you was it just announced this is going to be the last bug in no yeah more it, after there this. was talk going around that it was probably going to be the last event and i hadn't gone to one for a while so we went um and on the way back, just had some conversation about, we have heard that Charlie Allen and Guptel, who were the sole proprietors or the main people at OCI, had moved to Phoenix and were doing a new facility. And Firebird Raceway had just opened in August of 1983. So this is within a couple months space, this is all going on. And on the way back, as young entrepreneurial idiots do with no sight of where they're going, right. not a pot to piss in, use my language but you're like i got a good idea we go man we need to do one of these events so we go out to firebird raceway and talk to charlie allen and he charlie and i hit it off because we're both from southern california he used to be a funny car racer and um we just had a kinship and i ended up building several swimming pools for him later but um we just got a good relationship going and so we rented the facility. I remember we put seven hundred fifty dollars down. I don't know where we got the money from at that time, but so, I mean, seven hundred fifty dollars is a lot of money you know, back then for a deposit for the track. Now this is right after. That's the, just to save the day. Yeah, this was like the latter part of October, and right. we planned to do the event in January, the, the next January, three months away. So we did not have a lot of lead time for magazine articles or you know anything to promote the event. Uh, so I thought, let's. What we need to do is go talk to Gene Berg, and I credit Gene Berg a lot. Now, did you know Gene at the time? Not that well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I met him. You just thought, like, hey, this is a guy that would support racing because it's part of his business. Yep. Let me go see if I can get him on board. Exactly. And I had been doing some announcing work at the Sacramento event from '77 on. Dino Don did a lot of it, and then John Stafford would have me announce at Sacramento Raceway once in a while. So I knew all these guys. So I made a trip over, it was the first part of November of 83, and they were having a race, for, Gene actually said we're having a race for the gold meeting, we have our final race at Palmdale, and that was in November, I can't remember the date, that month. Mm -hmm. And Gene says, if you come over and talk to the guys, we'll see if we can get a bunch of them to come out to your event. Right. So we went to uh, this race for the gold meeting at the Berg shop, off, off the line, and uh, 1325 <laughs> North Lime. Right. And uh, everybody was game because where were they going to go race? They had Carlsbad, um, Bakersfield, but there really wasn't a whole lot else going on. And so they agreed to come. And so Gene probably was responsible for 30 to 40 racers showing up at our first event. And what was the, so for some of us younger guys, what was the race for the gold? Like it was just a, a particular was, series he was running? It was a point series they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember all the categories and if it was all, I remember it was handicap racing, so it wasn't like heads up racing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but the last race I announced at Palmdale, Bernie Longjohn was the track manager, and I still remember Gary Bergen, and, and I think we were one of the last two in the finals. But, um, but it was a fun time, so that kind of springboarded us, and I had a lot of good friends in the area that helped us clubs, that helped with the car show. And now, how big was Phoenix's VW scene at the time? You know, they were having little parking lot events in mm -hmm. Phoenix City College, and but it, it really, it was a risk. I mean, I, we, I didn't know if we'd get 1,000 yeah, so people or 500 people. Right, or, right. And come to find out, we, got enough, we had just enough time to get the word out. Uh, my wife helped me, and we... We developed a mailing list over the years where we did direct mailers. We probably had a, almost 10,000 name mailing list by the time I sold the event. Uh, and that was like money. I mean, those people get a flyer, the percentages are 40% are coming. Yeah. So um, 
it was kind of a calculation that worked out. But um, but we at that first event we had almost four thousand people through the gate, which was the track was shocked. Charlie was shocked we got that kind of turnout in that short of time. Yeah. So he was happy to sign us up and right. Keep it. It. We want this next year. Yeah. yeah. So we did another one that fall, and then had a little uh, legal thing take place where it cost me a lot of money and. I got out of that bad arrangement, and um, I decided, you know, I'm going to start fresh. And I had a partner initially, it just did not work out. Well, you know, I, it's interesting. We've, we've talked about this several times on the podcast with different people that have had partners. Yeah. And one of the advice I give to people that are starting a new business, I say, don't get a partner, just do it on your own. Because yep. it's always when things are great they're great and when they're bad they're real bad real bad and what what happens usually in most dynamics of partnerships unless you've got one guy that's the field guy one guy that's the office guy if it's both like let's see what you can bring to the table usually somebody's falling short a yeah. little bit you know what i mean and and it creates quite a bit of um quite a bit of contention and you know, the tough thing is like you started out as friends. You don't want to not be friends, but this really isn't working and I'm doing all the work. What are you doing? Yeah. You know, it's just, so it's always, it's always an interesting dynamic. Sounds like you've got some history there. That one of my first, it, my first venture on the, going to business on my own was a guy says, Hey man, I'll put the money up and you do the, yeah. you know, and I thought, wow, man, what a, what a great deal Sweetheart this is. Deal. Yeah. And then I thought like, wait a second, I work for him. Like I don't, we're, we're not partners. I work for this guy. And so. But again, it's one of those lessons. You're not going to learn that in business school. Nope. You know, and I'll so. tell you what, it was an expensive lesson. I mean, it was how bad it was, and I won't go into all the details, that after we did our first buggerama, waiting for me at the gate was a sheriff and served me papers. And my ex-partner was suing me. He had no right to anything. There was no legal It rank. just started as a conversation. Yeah. And so for six months, not a lot of people know that this is, you know, if you're a promoter, everybody thinks you're rich. They don't know yeah. all the battles and all the struggles. It, uh, if, if my wife's grandmother hadn't been a retired film star for, from the early silent movie days and lived in Malibu and had money, we'd have been screwed. Yeah. Um, so she loaned me the money. And I said, you know, I signed a contract with her. We borrowed the money. We had to pay legal fees. We didn't have to pay the the uh, ex-partner or anything, the judge threw him out and said, J he, he s said he should have a part of our event. And he was mad that I split away from him and didn't want to be do anything with him. I said, you can do whatever you want. Go talk to the track. If they like you, great. Um, but I said, I'm, I can't do this. We're, we're going to go separate ways. So he was suing me because he, for some reason, his brain, he thought I couldn't divorce myself from him and do it without him. Right. The judge threw it out. The judge not only threw it out, he told, told him, you've got no case. You can't force someone to be in business with your right. same business. And the judge says, do you want to counter soon? I go, I don't even want to talk to the individuals anymore. I just want to be just done. Just want to be it. done, yeah. You know, but that on. cost me $8,500. And in 1984, fortune. that was, might have been $85,000. Yeah. And you're right. You learn lessons when you go into business of any kind that you don't learn in business school. Nobody loses in business school. Well, and that, yeah, and that, and really the, the, I mean, the most beneficial lessons that I've ever received in my life has, has been real world experiences yep. that I've gotten where you go through these, these experiences where things like, this is great. I'm rich. And you look at a year later, you're like, what happened? <laughs> how, how did I lose everything? Yeah. You know, and, and you're, and, and part of it is a little bit of naivete. And then there's also this lack of experience of like, well, I'm not really sure what to do. And what do people that have money do in this situation? And then, oh, I know I should invest some of this in something else. And, Anytime people sniff that you've got a couple bucks in your pocket, yeah. the investors just come out of the woodworks. Yeah, they do. You know? Well, and I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on that part of my life other than to realize that it was a really good lesson. It is. But that's um, the thing. There's good takeaways you know. from all those. And, and, and going forward, you just kind of, okay, I learned something from that. And, and even every, every bad experience, you know, there's yeah. going to be an experience you can benefit from. So, And it, we were talking about promoting shows. And, you know, I've promoted... Huh. I, I mean, I ended up, uh, I, I, do, I just only do the Las Vegas auto swap meet. That's sort of the conversation where there was a slight misunderstanding in the conversation. Next thing I know, we're renting the Sam Boyd Stadium on the east side of town. And I'm thinking, <laughs> all right, well, this is going to be, I mean, I'm a car guy. I love it. I think we should put something on for the scene. And then it's like, 
you're just hoping to break even your yeah, first event. Exactly. So you have the money for the next event. And there's just always, uh, there's the nerves of, I hope everybody shows up and I need spectators and I need participants. Yeah. Yeah. I need both to make it work. Right. And then, you know, the best part, you kick off that first event and you're like, Hey, did you get a swap space? You're like, nah, I wanted to see how the first event was going to go. And you think to yourself, like, you're the same guy that complains that That's nobody right. does anything over That's here. Right. And then you put the time, effort, and energy into it, and then people don't want to don't support. I mean, I, I try to make it a point to, if I go buy a show near a show, I try to support. I'll pay, I'll pay an entry fee, not even under the show, just to try to, yep. just because I believe in supporting the things that are around your event, you know? And so it's uh, it, it's always been interesting, but there's always this learning curve of like, Okay, I was telling you again. I don't call on many sponsors for any of my events, and it, part of it's like I don't like to be first beholden, be, beholden to, to people, and second, yeah. beg for money. I want my event. I want you to be like, what can I do to be a part of your event? And, exactly. And with the event we've been doing here in Vegas, those those people are reaching out to me because they see the impact, the, the impact and engagement that the people that come to the event have. But. Yeah, promoting shows is is always something to, to do. And you did you did the Phoenix Bugarama for quite a while. Well, we did thirty three events. We used to do two a year. Um, there was one year during the uh, Gulf War. I only did one because uh, I was also running a big construction company at the time. And when we went, we we lost. Oh my gosh! I think we dropped when the recession hit. No, it wasn't the ninety two Gulf War. It was the 07, 08. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, when the bottom fell out of the home building market, I mean, we were tied into home building. Oh, we yeah. lost seventy percent of our business. Yeah, and that just, quick, you know, all of a sudden, business dropped, overhead still up here, and we were slicing and dicing the pie every way we could think of to cut overhead staff. You know, man, we let go of leases on buildings, and uh, that's another whole business lesson. I sur- went through probably four a couple mini recessions and a major recession in my business career and all those combined you gain experience from on what to do and not you do. change your position every time every and reset time. so the next time it happens you'll be ready that's right you know yeah it's, you, it, you know your comments about the events very few people understand because they either have never run a business and it's always the ones that have never had their own business or have no idea what business is that think you're getting rich because they go, oh, let's see, 5,500 people showed up at uh, $14 a head. You made, I go, you have no idea. Yeah, the toilets cost me $1,500. Exactly. I used to tell people, when when we first rented Firebird Raceway, we got out of there for, I think it was $3,500. The last event I personally did before we sold the event, $22,000 Twenty-two thousand dollars to the track. That was for. That's the, just for the track, and then you got to then you got to pay for the guys in the tower. You got to pay for the guys at the water box. You got to pay. Yep. I you got to pay. For, you got to pay yourself back for all, all the pre-event costs of advertising, direct mail. You know, posters. You know, car show awards, racer awards, t I mean, and people would hear that. They go, oh, "You're making a lot of money." But if, if it hadn't have been for my profession that I made my real living from. Right. Those events never would have happened, yeah. Because I made a pretty substantial income for what I was doing, but um, it was because I was an enthusiast that I was crazy enough to keep throwing the money out there and doing it. And so. the, and and part of that is, you know, you get people that that come up to you during the event, and go, you know, just twice a year, huh? That's it. Yeah. Like you're like um, because Vegas is the same. It's like this is Vegas. This is the desert from June. Till September, nobody wants nobody to be doing. It. Wants to be no there. one's coming out to a parking lot, and and trying to find an event. That's really the 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 key, right? When you go to some of these European events, they're different. I mean, European bug and they they have that they make that street a drag strip. There's a lot of cool aspect to that. But you go to some of the other, these other shows, and they're more of a festival type show, yeah. and that's kind of the direction that I'm going with one crazy weekend. With it being based at a hotel, everybody's there to kind of like that's the, the spot, right? And then I'm making things that are happening around the town that you're going to be involved in, but that's the home base. Everybody comes back to there. And the hotel turns into like a VW place for a while, you know? So it's, you know, when I went to Europe and I saw how the shells were over there, I thought this is completely different than what we do. And the guys from Europe come here and they're like, why is everybody leaving at 1.30? <laughs> yeah, Where, really. Where's everybody going? Off. You, you know what I mean? But it... it it's it's different because 
you know, they vacation different, they do everything different in Europe, but they make a pretty big event. And I think sometimes, I mean, I'm sure it's the same in Phoenix as in Vegas. I mean, from now until throughout the summer, there'll be car shows just about every single weekend, multiple car shows to go to here in town. And then part of the challenge that I have here in Vegas is I'm competing with Vegas. There's a million things to do in Vegas and who, who doesn't want to do something in Vegas? There's always, so you're competing with so many different levels of things, but I do it like most promoters do it. You do it for the love of the hobby, yeah. you know, cause, cause would, I'll tell you this right now, nobody's getting rich doing car shows. No, uh, There's nobody getting rich doing that. I, I had one guy in Phoenix, uh, the one year that I did one event because that was during the horrible recession. I just didn't make sense to put more money at risk when we didn't even know what was going to happen in our own industry. Um, this guy made t-shirts, you know, death to the buggerama, this punk promoter that was, he's going to put us out of business. And he was telling everybody, we're going to put the buggerama out of business. And I just laughed. Everybody would tell me, I said, good luck. I, I wish him the best of luck because yeah. he'll probably put himself out of business before it. And, and sure enough, he was, he came and went, he was a blowhard that just didn't have real good business practices and had to leave town because of it. Nobody, nobody well, liked the guys. Again, these are people that think like, oh, what you do is easy and, and I'll do it better. Yeah, I'll do and it better. My, and, and I always encourage people like, you should try to do. Exactly. Go do one. I mean, you know, put your effort and energy into it and then, you know, see what. Uh, see what comes of it. Yeah. like I'm, You know, and I'm, I was all for more events. I, I don't begrudge anybody. Go for it. I mean, if, if you can do that, it's better for everybody, the shops and everybody. I like to go to one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to do anything. I want to just go enjoy it, you know. But um, there was a period during the early 90s when somebody, and that's what promoted this Cowlick car I built that's on the cover of Hobby W's. There was a club in town that said, I wasn't in the Volkswagen events for VW's. I just was in it for the for money. money. Oh, that that <laughs> shot me into outer space. I thought you flipping. I said, and it okay. hurts. It hurts when people say stuff like that yeah. because you're like, I love this hobby so much. I want to contribute to it. I'm going to put this show on. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Yeah. I'm going to invest in the hobby. And then now everybody's turning around and said, he's not a VW guy. He's just in it for the cash. Like, yeah. have you well, only people, people? And you probably know you have. There's a number yeah. you have to put an event on. But I had thousands and thousands of dollars out of pocket pre-event costs renting the track paying for advertising paying for direct mail postage car show words there's no guarantee any of that's Nothing. coming back you get a rain I mean, you get a rain out weekend yeah. and then all of a sudden you're and we we were lucky in 33 events yep. we were never once we were never once rained out of an event we had yeah. rain the night before the week before the day of but we were never rained out of an event. And that's a lot of promoters don't have that luck. You know, I, so. I there's a guy here in town, a, a guy here in town that does a, a car. It started out as Mopars on the strip. And then when you exclude it to just Mopars, hard to get all those guys to show up. Then he did muscle cars on the strip. Then the Mopar guys were mad because they yep. lost their Mopar yep. on the event. But he had to make it bigger because he's doing it at Las Vegas exactly. Motor Speedway. That track, the Motor Speedway here in town, probably 30 plus thousand to rent it just to get the track. Yeah. Then you got to pay on top of everything, on top of everything else. And then they charge what they charge to get in the gate and you get your little kicker off That's that. Right. And it's like you, by the time you let, I mean, I did a swap meet. I mean, it couldn't be cheaper. It was $3,500 to rent the parking lot at Sam Boyd stadium for one day, 3,500 bucks. That seems pretty cheap. By the time we got done radio ads, flyers, like all the stuff to promote the first, that first event event cost us about $18,000 to do. Yep. And I'm sitting there thinking like, I hope people are going to show up because it's like, this is, you know, it's like, I hear, I hear the word on the street. People want this. Yep. They want a show. They want a this. And it's like, it's good luck. There's, there's no end to stories. You've probably heard as many as I've had, but that, that little rumor that got started, fired uh, you up to build, fired the, me up to say, you guys have no idea what my background is or what I've been involved in all these years. And I'm sick of hearing it. So I found a one owner 67 for $900 in Phoenix. This 85 year old woman sold me this straight, pristine, never hit, no rust, 67 bug. And uh, I proceeded in the next year to build this car. And um, it was right out of the gate. As a matter of fact, Frenchie DeHue had mm -hmm. just moved to Phoenix and he came to the ISCA show car, the international car. Uh, world of wheels in phoenix and saw my car there on display and that's how i got to reignite our friendship there um but my car and i didn't 
really build it to win anything. I just mm-hmm. built it to be nice. And that so we decided, well, let's compete with it for a while and see how we do. We won every show we were in with that car, non VW show. We yeah. went to the ISCA shows, which are high end cars, man. We're competing against Hondas, Toyotas, everything. And we, I've got a bunch of trophies where we won the compact custom class in 1996, three times in Arizona. And I thought, wow. And then the highlight of that was I had gone to the classic in 95 with the car. Mm -hmm. And um, RK says, hey, I want to take pictures of you. So the picture on the cover of the Hobby W's, he took me up in the Anaheim Hills and found this house that had this just hillside of flowers. And that's what's behind the, the shot of the car. And then Keith Soon was there at the same time, and he shot the car and did an article for Volksworld. So it came out in both magazines that year. Is that the first time your car is featured? A yeah. car that you own is featured? Yes. How's that experience when you get your car in the magazine? It was amazing. I mean, I didn't, in our case, says we got your car in the magazine. I said, wow, thanks. You know, I didn't expect it, but um, I didn't expect it to be on a cover. I've never seen a teal green car on the front of Hot Videos. They're usually red, white, black, or something else. Right. And, uh, he says, no, your car deserves it, man. And Keith did a and he, I've got pictures from my car, like my front disc brakes and a few other, or in some of Keith's books on cow look. And, yeah. Um, so it got a lot of attention. And really to top it off is in 96, um, there was a show in January 96 that we had our club cars in. There was eight of our cars in this display. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got a call from D. Berg that Gene had just passed away. And that... Man, that put a, a a tone of somberness over. I mean, we just we were all like a kick in the stomach. We thought, wow, you know. Now by this time, and he he passed away in '96. Now you, from the first show that you started yep. in what year? '84. You had, at that point you started to build a friendship with right. Gene Berg. Now, I wanted to touch on that for a second. Okay. So, how do you end up getting so Gene? You say, hey, I want to be one of the guys for Race for the Gold. Put up the event. So he comes out there. He supports the event. Yep. And from that point forward, you guys start to build a friendship? Yep. And from that time on, Gene Berg and Dee were sponsors for every event we did. I had their Gene Berg logo. I don't care who else was on there. I felt that that was credibility to be, right. have him be part of this. And uh, great people. They never, we had a great trip. We went to Europe with them in 94 for, for th- four weeks, three or four weeks. Went to a show at Avon Park. It was a, a Volksworld sh- drag race car show thing. Uh, Bernie, what was Bernie's last name? He's a car trimmer. Bernard Newberry. Bernard Newberry was there with his green Gia. It was amazing. Yeah. Vanagon was there with speakers all over it. And anyway, we were the featured guests at that show, and they treated us, you know, like we we're something special. But um, Dean and G and I had a great time. I, that's the only couple we've ever traveled with. That for three weeks we did everything together. Never had any arguments. Had a great time. Never got sick of them. No, we went to Germany together. We went to the Volks. I got to tell you this story. We went to Volksworld factory in uh, Wolfsburg. Volkswagen. Volkswagen. The Volkswagen yeah, yeah. factory in Wolfsburg. And we're standing in the lobby, and there's people speaking Chinese and all kinds of languages for the tours. And Gene and I are talking. I said, I wonder if anybody in here speaks English. And this, this chap turns around, and he goes, I'll be with you in just a second in perfect English. And then starts rattling off Mandarin Chinese again. And I'm thinking, wow. And so... He says, just give me a minute, I'll be right back with you guys. So we introduced ourselves, and I introduced Gene as a manufacturer building high-performance parts and that I promoted VW events, and he goes, I've got just the thing for you guys. We got a personalized tour and a looked like an African safari cut-out rabbit cabriolet. Oh, really? Doors cut out in the back, cut out in the front. He, the guy, uh, Wadsworth was his name, gave us what they call the seven-mile tour, and they go right to where the ships come in with these you know, 15 foot high rolls of steel that they put into their dies and start stamping doors and roofs and things. They took us right from that point all the way to the end of the factory. And this was like a four or five hour tour. He's driving us through everywhere, all the automation and where they're painting the cars and dipping them and galvanizing the bodies to where the cars are rolling out done at the end. Wow. And that was an amazing trip. I mean, if we just it fell into it, the guy just treated us like we were royalty. Now, I. My only experience with Gene Berg, he bought a set of DCNFs from me one time at Pomona Swap. You know, I was pretty excited yeah. um, that Gene Berg bought a set of carburetors from me. But I never got to meet the man. What was, how would you describe Gene Berg to those people that didn't meet him? You know, he, there was a lot of stuff said about him. He's a very opinionated, but he had a right to be. He's very knowledgeable. I mean, and I'd heard all kinds of things, but 
they were nothing but friendly and, and generous people with us. I mean, we've and to this day, we're still friends with them. I'm friends with Gary, Doug. I don't see Clyde as much. I need to get to go see Dee. She's getting up there. Um, but very genuine people. We, we started something at our events that after the race was over, we would have a big banquet, a, like a potluck banquet in the Ramada on the grass at Firebird Raceway. Yeah. And uh, that became a big tradition that the, a lot of the racers, John Sugar and a lot of other racers would stick around and bring food for it. And we had a big party after the event just doing that. But Gene was a great guy. He's, um, I follow a lot of the things that he taught and a lot of people didn't believe in, like my cylinder heads. I run these semi-hemi heads and everybody says they don't work. I said, well, of all the people I know, I'm one of the few guys that has driven my car anywhere yeah. around, around the country. Uh, in the, there's a, uh, on YouTube under R. Mortensen is my name on there. Um, I still have videos from when I drove to the VW Classic, the last classic in my chop top. And I have, I shouldn't be filming this while I'm driving, but I got my phone filming the oil temp, the oil pressure, and my RPM, engine RPM. My oil pressure was like at 50, 55 pounds. The temp right. was like 175, and my RPMs are right at 3,400. And uh, it was like the sweet spot. And so I told everybody, okay, folks, this is a 2275, 48 IDAs, open chamber heads. What kind of compression? Uh, I ran eight and a half to one. Eight and a half to one. Yeah, and I'm building one now that's going to have nine to one with those same type of cylinder heads. Yeah. And uh, I ran pump gas, and uh, no, I don't drag race it. I, I decam my motors. I don't run real big cams in them because why Why do you need to? What do you run for cam? Uh, my last motor had an Ingle K65, and a lot of people looked at that and laughed, but it's done. It's done at 6,000. It won't right. go any further. But from zero to 6,000, it's kind of an off-road cam. It comes on strong, fun to drive around town, drive it anywhere on the freeway. And uh, there's a lot of other cam grinds out there now that work real good too, but that's been kind of my go-to for a, a big driver. Yeah, I like I so. like a, I, I like a, I've got, I'm a big type four guy. I love type fours. I've yeah. got type fours and all my buses and my split one that's at buddy shop has a 2600 type four. But I like the off-road cams because they're because what you feel in the car is torque. Torque. That's what you feel. Yeah. And, and it's like if you can, you know, if if you can uh, get the feeling, you what do you need to wring its neck for? And so yeah. I've got my Type Four that's uh, in the Bull Run bus motor. That's actually in the double cab right now. While I have the double cab motor getting freshened up, which is a two point six liter Type Four nice. with forty eights. But torque is why I like the Type Fours. Sure. They're heavy on torque. Yeah, pushes the thing out of the way. And I and I think the reason, one of the reasons that my Bull Run bus motor is still on the road since two thousand one, never had the heads off, is because I never rev it above six grand. No. It's like fifty five hundred RPM. You motor. don't need to. Not when they're a torque motor. Yeah. No, they're those are fun motors to drive, and that really that's the key to success on all these cruises we've been on too. Is we don't. We do not overcam our motors. We don't put an FK89 or a K8 or an FK43. Or we're not drag racing. We're having fun driving. Yeah. So. And this car that you built, what year did you build that car? The the, uh, the this, blue. This this 67, one. I built yeah. it in '94, '95. Is when I put it together. And so that car is the one that you drove to. You oh. drove that car to yep. Detroit. 1997. The first year laying it. Not Lane Evans. Dick Kirsten gave me shit when we were in Detroit. Dean Kirsten, yeah. Yeah, because I, I trailered it the first year, and I thought, oh, that's it. I'm going to drive it next year. So uh, the second year I drove it, and we arrived at uh, Volkswagen of America. They had a big tent set up in the parking lot. And um, they asked, well, where's your trailer? I go, it's in Phoenix. I drove it this time. So, yeah. And it did really well. I get, when I wasn't on it, I got around 24 miles to the gallon. So, But if I played around... I few times i horsed around on the freeway in the middle of wyoming i was racing a mach 1 mustang down the freeway that was a stupid event but yeah anyway well listen um, you can't back down from a race had to clean the carbs out they were getting tired of right. idling down the freeway now your wife did this with you too yeah she well in that event she decided she didn't want to drive that far so with she me. flew so she flew and met me d berg and and flew um and then she rode back with me who drove with you just you by yourself yeah i drove all the way there so Wow. The, but there was a caravan of us. We had uh, Art Thrain from Salt Lake, Don Belita from Phoenix, uh, Steve Hollingsworth was from Sino. Now, Art, I haven't had Art on the podcast 
you should get him on sometime. He's a smart yeah. dude. Yeah. He's he's, uh, he's not doing a lot of VW stuff right now. He's a contractor, HVAC right. contractor. But well, yeah, some of us got to eat. <laughs> yeah, no. But that dude is uh, probably one of the most dialed in guys I've ever met on carburetors. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's really a lot of fun. We had so much fun. How long that trip take you? Uh, we took a full week. We went out, took a, about two and a half days to get out there. And the fun thing is along the way, like we had stops in uh, Colorado. We stopped so fine, hosted our cruise one year. We stopped there for lunch and they, they gave tours. And then we went on to Ogallala, Nebraska, stayed in a hotel. Then we went on to Lincoln, Nebraska on the next stop. And Williamson Motors in Lincoln, Nebraska uh, put up, they cleared the whole showroom, the whole front of the a dealership and we parked all our Volkswagens around the front of this dealership. Oh, really? And we were giving people rides. Rick Zavala got a ticket for burning out in the burglar. Um, he just went around the corner and got on it and there was a cop sitting right there. Well, uh, well speaking of Rick, I mean, he passed away yep. uh, about, well, about a year and a half ago, maybe? Now. About a year ago, yeah. And uh, I had met him at... He had seemed like an interesting character. He is, and I think you know people are hot, people that don't know people or people that aren't really public. Maybe they're hot or cold on him, and I didn't get a chance to sit with him because you know I just I, I thought you bought this car, and I said, and I I, I want to say you bought it a long time ago. They bought it in the nineties yep. at some point, paid probably twelve grand for it or something like that, which was a ton of money back then. Right before Gary went to Hawaii, I believe is when Gary sold it. So. Yeah, but buys the car, and I think that's about the price that it went for. And then I just wanted to, I wanted to do a podcast with him, just ask him like, so did you buy the car because you knew that one day, because that, that car is a, leg, a fairly legendary yeah. car. It's been, it, it's been there, it's done that, but there's a lot of history with that car. And I never had a chance to sit down with him and chat with him. But uh, that was, so did he have the that car on that cruiser? Did he had a yeah, different he car? Yeah, he did. We trailered the car most of the way. It yeah. wasn't driven because he had the real BRMs oh. on it and. One of them had some cracks in it, so we said that's probably nah. not a good idea to drive that. Nah, what BRMs don't have cracks? Yeah. Listen, legends drive on cracked BRMs. That's yeah. what I. <laughs> my brother keeps telling me, you gotta take those real BRMs off the car and, and run these re- reproductions. I said, nah, I'm just gonna drive yeah. real BRMs. If something happens, it happens. What are you gonna the, do? There was a, an interesting story. It was in the magazine from the first cruise, um, the first year, which was '96 of the cruise. Gary Berg got uh, Sally Everly, who was the marketing gal for Volkswagen of America and put her in, in the burglar and did a massive burnout right in the front of Volkswagen of America. And those burnout marks were there for the next couple of years, man. Yeah. It was just, but it was a historic patented Gary Berg burnout, man. It was crazy. But uh, yeah, we, we had so much fun. The Volkswagen of America honored Gene Berg. They put on a big uh, banquet the first year. I mean, a big round table, giant banquet with VIP executives from Volkswagen. Um, gave the birds a donation it was it was a really cool event and then it kept going and there were cruises to colorado cruises to washington i wasn't able to participate in all of them but um and we're, we're even talk right now we're talking about you know what we need to do something again before we're all too old to- well yeah and, I, and there, there's a show in there's a show in november that's the and i've threatened for like multiple years to just do a cross-country drive and i think the you know the the, the most fun would be Cross country drive there with a bunch of people get a big caravan over there, and then everybody coordinate shipping for their car on the way back. You know, I'm, I'm sure if twelve people split a hauler, it's not going to be that expensive, yeah. and they can just drop them off on the way. But I think that would be the fun part to do because it's like you know, you, listen, you only live once, right? And it's like you might as well. Now that the world's become so much bigger due to the internet, due to social media, due to all these things that. The world seems super, super small. And yep. it's like, there's nothing worse than being at a show and you don't have your car. That's true. Like, well, I got a car back home and I wish I could show it to you, but, you know. You know, driving the event was was probably what made it special. We st- we met so many people along the way. I'll, I'll tell you another story real quick on the first cruise. We stopped at Conquerors Motors in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's primarily a Porsche dealership. Conquerors quality Porsches and everything. And they decided to host part of this cruise the first year too. So we went from Lincoln, Nebraska, and Conquerors Motors was this next second stop after that. Um, and at the end of that show, I've got pictures of my car parked in that show. And I went up to the, one of the local policemen. I said, "You know, it's kind of customary we do burnouts at the end of these shows to kind of put on a show for the folks that are here." 
<laughs> and this lady cop looks at me and she goes, you do what? And I go, well, we go out in the street and we kind of light the tires up and smoke the wheels a little bit. Well, the side street between Conker's Motors and some other dealership emptied out right into a main thoroughfare. So there was only about an eighth of a mile. Right. <laughs> and uh, she she looked at me and I had Don Belita standing there and a few of the other guys on the cruise. And she says, I must be out of my mind to let you do this. She goes, okay, well, you promised me that nothing bad's going to happen. And I said, it'll be fine. We'll just light him up a little bit. So I take my car out there, and I've got a Flowmaster exhaust on mine. It sounds like a Kawasaki Ninja, you know, with the 48s on it. And I get out there, and I do this burnout, and all of a sudden, all the car alarms in the dealerships go off. There's car alarms going off everywhere, and she's over there, shut it, <laughs> shut it down, shut it down. So she stopped it before we even had a couple of cars out there doing it. But, yeah, there's there's things like that we did along the way that just... You know, like yeah, there was kind of the thing when, when the first time I took my bus out was 2000, 2002. I took it to um, 2002 or 2001. I took it to the Classic. That's where I, well, first time I debuted the, the what's now known as the Bull Run bus. And when I was leaving, I said, well, I'm not being the last one. I'm going to be one of the first ones to leave because when I leave here, I'm going to send this thing. You know, I want to show people this bus what has got a big do. motor. Yeah. So I left. And I just lit them up because especially there was a little bit of water in the gutters I was leaving. So I just stomped it. And, my, and at that time, people weren't used to seeing buses oh, that yeah. would just get out there and just roast the hides. And uh, it felt pretty good. And then I, I, I did it the next time when I debuted my Type 34 Gia. I was in the row of the cars that debut and everybody's like white gloving their car back on the trailers and all this stuff. And I was making sure I was the first one to leave. And I said, I'm going to get out of here. And I just kind of pull out and the, there's a, a video on YouTube that there's just this huge crowd around my car. And then I'm like, well, I don't have a choice now. I mean, uh, now I have to. And I had a 2.6 liter type four wow. in it and I just freaking stood on it and pitched it sideways coming out of Nick's str slung it back straight and shot down the turn lane. <laughs> and, uh, it, it's one of those things where it's like, listen, people get mad about stuff like that, but I think it's pretty fun, especially yeah. if you're not, I mean, it's not like today where these guys are in these takeovers and shutting down an intersection and just getting crazy. But yeah, it's, a, it, I think it's a rite of passage at certain events that it's good to do a little burnout. I did one at pier side parts. They weren't, I had the, the carbon cab where I've got a 2.6 liter and I can just stomp the brake and just roast the back tires on that thing. And, uh, they weren't big fans of that when I did that, but uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, you know, my whole thing is like, well, let's give somebody something to People talk about. People remember that. Stuff. Yeah, it's I mean, it's I, fun stuff. I mean, the year that I drove this car, '97, and the April Buggerama, I started our burnout contest at the event, and nobody would go do it, and so um, Sheldon Heffler, whose brother Johnny Heffler is a VW drag racer from way back with Scotty McManus and. Lyle Cherry and Heffler, they had a car. Anyway, so Sheldon says, man, we're not getting anybody signed up for this burnout contest. And I thought, crap. Well, I'm in the middle of the event, you know, trying to coordinate things. I said, so I go over and get my car out of the car show. It was parked over there. I said, I'll be the, the blue first car, one. the teal this car. One. I'll be the first. I said, all right, I'll set the standard. It may not be good or bad, but I had a line lock on my car. Yeah. So I get out there, and it's still to this day on the Internet. If you go to Ocean Street Video, VW Burnout Contest, my video has been on there since 1997 doing this burnout. Oh, yeah. And so I get in the water box, start in first gear, and I thought, no, it needs to be set. So I pull it into second gear and stand on it, and I hit the rev limiter at 7,000 RPMs, and my whole car is encased finally in smoke. You can't even see my car. Well, I left my window, driver's window cracked open a little bit, and I don't know why, and smoke's starting to come into the car, and I can't breathe. And I thought, oh, crap, i got to end this now. So, I, And I didn't even know if anybody was in front of me because the guys are out there filming it and taking pictures. And uh, so I roll out of it. But that burnout, has li it's been out there for Legendary a couple of decades. Legendary to this day. You know? <laughs> it's like, and it wasn't the biggest VW burnout ever done, but... But it's fun. It's fun to have an opportunity to do something like that yeah. at an event where, you know, you, you know, it's like you show up with a real fast car at a car show. And what do you do? Just sit there and show people that yep. you get a fast car. It's like you want to show them a little bit, of, a little taste of the heat. So, well, this, the story I've never told about this car, I realized this was May. Mm -hmm. No, this was April. And within six weeks, I'm going to have to drive this car on the cruise. So I went and did a, a tension test on my valve springs and I had to replace all my valve springs. Really? <laughs> so I had to pull the motor out, drop the motor, put new valve springs on it, have a friend of mine, Mike Fisher, go through and just check the heads and everything, and I put it all back together to drive it. But 
Yeah, so that secret's out. Nobody knew that story. But Yeah, but la- the last-minute refresh. Yeah, I thought I can't drive it 5,200 miles and have a valve spring break on me. So No, that's but you know, that's the testament to, to these motors. If they're built right, they'll, yeah. they'll run good. And, and again, you know, you go back to Berg, right, with his pick of the litter with his valve springs yep. and stuff like that. Yep. I mean, I, when I was younger, I had that Gene Berg, the Berg book on how to you know, read this and, or how to build your, all the tech articles. Right, right. And I would just geek out and read it. And I'd say, well, Gene Berg says, and I'm like, ah, but Bill always says Gene Berg, Gene Berg. They would call me Billy Berg. You know what I mean? Like, all you keep saying is what, and I'm like, yeah, but again, I was broke and I didn't, I wanted a fast motor, but I needed it to live forever. Yeah. And so I needed to Do right try to follow. Time. And I had a motor, I had a 1904, a 74 by, uh, 74 by 94. And that motor, no, 74 by 90.5. That's a, it, that's a uh, 1904. Is that a 1904? Yeah, I think that's what, yes, that's what, uh, 74 by 94, that's what it is. And I had that motor, and that motor ran, I mean, super, super good. It was 7 to 1 compression. It would start, you wouldn't have to touch the gas, because yeah. I sat there just agonizing over the jets, the Venturis, and all that stuff, just trying to make sure... And someone said, you know, if that car is running right, you turn that key and it'll start on its own. No pumping the gas, no, you know, whatever. And I mean, I had so much energy and time in that car. And I took it to the track, 7 1 compression, a full dress car. That car ran a 1460 was the fastest time. And people just dogged on me. And I thought, that's fast. For a street car, that's fast. That is fast yeah. for a street car. And Most so, street cars, V8 cars can't go that fast. Yeah. So, so well, and now we're obviously in a different world with 700 horsepower turnkey, you know, street street cars with air conditioning but you know it, it's there's something to be said and, and that's really what comes down to the vw hobby right there's something to be said about a car you can literally build every aspect of it on your own yeah and and the hobby to get into doing that is you know is what keeps the hobby exciting you know now you had the yellow car you had the it was like a mustard car now what yep. year did you have that car Cause I, that's, that's a pretty a fairly famous chop top yeah that you had. it was chopped by a guy named kiyoki i he lives up in Washington. Um, I saw it advertised on the Samba, and it was like 17000 some crazy number. And I called him up and said, well, would you sell it without the motor? Well, he wouldn't. So eventually it sold to somebody. And this, this gal bought it. Her mother passed away, and she wanted a Volkswagen. She knows nothing about him, and she buys this chop top with a dual-carb 1776 in it. And she lived in Redding, California. Mm-hmm. Well, I think after a while she realized it wasn't really a good car for her to own. So she advertised it and uh, it was considerably less. And I was gonna build a chop top. At this time I had a, I had a 1984 Porsche uh, 911 with a 3.6 twin plug motor in it and flared the convertible? fenders. Yeah, the white convertible. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was afraid I was gonna die in that car because every time I got in it, I went too fast. So yeah. I ended up deciding to trade that i traded that actually for an oval window from larry schultz i got his black oval window it was a beautiful car what year is the porsche convertible yeah 84 84 it's got Por- steel flares on it um, and it's a twin plug motor and somebody put that motor in it because it didn't come with it no because that's a, that's no. a that's a 964 motor right. the twin plugs right and but the first time i opened the deck lid and i saw two distributor craps i'm going <laughs> you're like, oh my goodness exactly right two distributor craps you're like oh yeah. good grief anyway so and i got i got that car for a really good price i wasn't too unhappy but anyway to make a long story short uh the porsche thing was a short-lived experience i've owned several of them and i thought you know i just need to stick with Volkswagen. well it's different you own a porsche everyone's trying yep. to race you. exactly you drive a bug you're trying to race everybody yep. you know and what i mean but it's just this weird it's this weird dynamic weird that wherever you're at you've got a honda accord breathing down your neck you, yep. <laughs> i mean everybody's trying to get a piece of the champ i had guys pulling over next to me that were in these big black cadillacs with gold rings on and necklaces and say, hey you want to sell that thing and i really don't want to sell it anyway to make a long story short i ended up trading it away and then i wanted to build a chop top but i was just so knee deep in business i just didn't have a lot of time and that car came up on the samba again for almost half what kiyoki was originally selling it for so i called the gar- gal in redding a friend of mine had a ford diesel truck and a f- trailer and we ran up there and i got it uh, but when i got it it had the hawaiian look it was white interior mm. polished mp5 spokes chrome everything chrome glove box cover mm-hmm. and i thought no, that's not me so i'm going to remake this car 
and I had some alloys and I had a different motor, had a 1776 that got hot. I took it apart and the top of the barrels were blue. I mean, they were the same. They ran warm, hot. yeah. So I just redid the whole car, redid the gearbox, put the wheels on it, uh, new interior, about you, scat seats. You did the deck lid? Um, I did the deck lid and the rear apron. I yeah. made that rear apron. Yeah. Um, and uh, then yeah. I blacked everything out. I wasn't going to dechrome it because the paint was still good, so I just had powder coated everything that was, the side moldings were black, and uh, I had some Brizio running boards that were powder coated black. Um, so I really just changed the look of it. I wanted it to be more like a cow look car. And uh, I owned that car for 10 years. I drove that car everywhere. I mean, if you go online again to R. Mortensen, it shows me at car shows and driving it. What motor did you have in that? 2275. Yeah. Yeah. So the big 22, the, the, the 2275, 76. Yep. I mean, you get, everybody's back and forth in the displacement of the motor. But yeah. uh, And everybody used to say, every time. It's built to drive, and it was decammed. I had a had a K sixty five. I had a K eight in it originally, mm -hmm. and I absolutely hated it for driving around town. It was just too. It was like pulling up to the starting line at the drag strip every stoplight. It just too temperamental for me. And uh, yeah, I drove it to Auburn when we did the reveal on the Raise nine twelve, and even Bob Hull and everybody says you you drove that all the way here from Phoenix, and it was like hundred and six degrees, <laughs> and. Uh, and A.J. Sims met me in, uh, where were we, in Ventura somewhere. He met me before the grapevine. He drove his fastback that's turbocharged. Yeah. He and I drove up 99 together, and he's racing everybody <laughs> on the freeway on the way up. But every time we stopped, A.J. would pull out his infrared thermometer, and he'd use it under my head as an exhaust to go, how do you get this motor to run so cool? And I go, yeah, there's a lot of oiling mods and stuff to it. So. Now you had a, uh, so you have this car from what year? The the I had it from about. And what color is it? it looks like Caltrans it's, yellow. Yeah, it's, I think it's. I don't know what the official color was. It, there's a color GM color called Okra. It's a pickup truck color. But later, Kiyoki sent me an email. I think he said it was Triumph TR6 color or something. But could be. You know, it was early Triumph sports cars. Um, I had to do a little bit of work on it because I had to match the color for the deck lid and the rear apron. I made all that stuff. Now, and what the deck lid, you made it like a steel version it's of... It's a steel version of a, like an MP Of an MP deck, deck lid, yeah, I'm, 67. I'm making a lot of those right now for people. So, so do you do that? Like, that's one of the things you started doing once you made that deck lid. People are like, hey, I want you to make me a deck lid. Yeah, and I've done convertible deck lids, all kinds of stuff. So. And, what's it, and, and what's it run if somebody's having you do a deck lid? Well, they have to supply the deck lid because I don't right. have a supply of deck lids. But it's it depends on what type of deck lid. So it's it can be anywhere from 400 to 900, depending on what they want. The apron, if they asked me to make an apron, oh, that'd be a... What I did is I saved the factory part mm -hmm. that has the stamped piece. And then right below where the seal is on the 67, I cut it. And everything below that, I remade it. So I have a, a, a piece of half-inch steel I made that actually has the bend that the 67 bottom of the apron has is a template. Uh, but I have shrinkers and stretchers and everything, so I have English wheels. So, so I you do that. that, you kind of do that as a hobby type yeah, thing? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's my, my side gig right now is since I retired, pretty much that's what I do. Rick's Metal Fabricating. Yeah. I like it. And I have if, a website on it. Let's see. what The, the web, website here is... Uh, and there's not a lot on it right now, but it's uh, ricksfabricating.com. Yeah, ricksfabricating.com, and you can do custom metal. So you'll do a chop top for somebody too? Yeah. I'm actually, uh, Ledbetter wants me to do one for the magazine. They want to, they haven't a done tech one. tech article? They haven't done one in 30, 40 years. And I said, well, okay, I'll do it. And I have the car. I've got a 67 that's perfect. It's never been hit. Yeah. And, uh so that's downstream. So when you're going to chop a 67, I mean, you saw my chopped up here. Mine's like a four inch chop. Yep. Which to me, that chop is like a perfect chop. It, it is because, a perfect chop. Because it looks just like my yellow car. Because it, it, it doesn't, it's not too low. And then you have yeah. the pull down chops and you got a bunch of different. I don't like those. My very first one, my oval, I couldn't find another roof. That was one that I actually. It wasn't a full pull down. I, I tipped it forward a little bit, mm -hmm. but that was my first one. Shoot, I did it with a gas welder and a hacksaw and a grinder, you know, and I was 19 years old when I did it. Well, you got to make do, right? Um, and so when I did that, 
I learned a lot of things. Then the second one I did was a 67. And I think I sent you a picture of that when I'm kneeling by it. Um, and I'd just gone to a bug in in the early 70s and st I saw the new, you know, shoot, who was there, who wasn't there. Empey was there, Schley Brothers. Um, At which one? Which, which show oh, was this? 72, 73, I went to a bug in where there was a ton of chop tops there, gas cars. And that got me going on doing a late model. So I did a 67 then. It's funny because I got these cars done and people would come up and offer me too much money and I had to sell them. So right, right. So when you got rid of the yellow car, was that the same thing? Somebody came up and offered you money no, and had to buy it? It was more of a, just a transition. We're doing some things in the family and I needed to unload some things. And, um, and that was not actually a sale. I ended up with a mid-engine 27 oh, Roadster. This, um, yeah, this sounds like trouble. Yeah. So it, and then I ended up selling that car, but um, it was kind of a. So the mid-engine Roadster was a steel-bodied. Somebody took the time to make. No, it was a fiberglass car. So it was a fiberglass yeah. car, and it was actually a Hot VW's featured car at one time. It was a mid-engine Volkswagen with a twenty-one ten in it. And how and how'd that thing run? Great. It was so, like driving a slot car, man. It was a yeah. The engine was right behind the the bench seat. Um, but everything else looked 100% hot rod, drop super bill axle. All kinds well, yeah, of you sent me the picture, and I thought, like, what is this? This yeah. is like a hot rod. If, and if you guys are listening right now, if you go to the YouTube video, I'll actually have a YouTube video that's got panning through a lot of pictures of these cars so you guys can see what what cars we're talking about. But, can, so anyway, the, the chop top, I probably owned that the longest. I, I had that for almost 10 years. The yellow car? Yeah, the yellow one. What happened to the blue car from Hot VWs? Uh, a guy in Phoenix bought it from me. Uh, right, let's see, that was 97, 98. My wife wanted her kitchen remodeled. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm not taking out a loan to do it. Right. And I ended up selling my car to a guy named John Morrison, who still has it to this day in Phoenix. Nice condition, it's still in a nice shape. I, don't, I haven't seen it in probably five or 10 years, so I don't know. He keeps it garaged, um, but he's owned it longer than I did. He's owned it since 98, so, um, but it still looks exactly the same same interior and everything so but. now after that so as you get rid of these cars so when did you what is after the yellow car you get the hot rod then you get that that little 32 you get rid well, of that I, I parked it for a while i had a lot of stuff to do at my house i do all my own work i like i'd remodeled my wife's sewing room that was a turned out to be a two-year project so i finally got that done it turned out nice got to keep mom happy yeah. and um my, my problem is we moved into a beautiful home. It's on two acres, but it's, uh, I used to have a six car garage and I've got a three car garage with all my English mm. wheels and everything. And I had to put everything on wheels. And so my next goal is to get the garage extended. So I have a place to work yeah. on what I'm doing. So, cause right now I've got to roll everything out and then roll it back in. But I have a, uh, my daughter surprised me when I retired two years ago, it was kind of like, the year of the cars for me, my the company I work for gave me a new Dodge pickup when I retired. <laughs> nice. And then all of a sudden, my daughter asked me to come over. She goes, <clears throat> "Stop by, we got something for you." And I get over there. She's got this ragtop cow look bug, and she goes, "Here's." And she hands me the keys, and she goes, "Here, this is yours." And she she had it repainted by a guy locally named Dino, who used to paint a lot of the cars there. Not and then Buddy came along, but Dino used to work. Uh, I think. I think uh, Buddy and uh, Matt Howard both worked for him. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. I know Matt Howard worked for him for sure. And I think and that Matt, may be. I'll tell you what, Matt's a very talented guy too. He is. There's, yeah. a, lot of, there's a, lot of, a lot of the young guns in Phoenix, yeah. they're all now old like me, and they're yeah. pushing their late 40s or early 50s. And uh, yeah. Yeah, no, there's some real talent in those groups. But anyway, Dino painted it. It's kind of a cream colored. And then I thought, well, you know what, Shanna, let me finish it. Don't do the interior motor or anything. So I, I had a gearbox. Rick Stanchfield built me a nice gearbox, and it's built really nice, super dip everything. And uh, I'm building a uh, 92 thick wall by 78-stroke motor for it right now. And uh, I may put a little more cam on that, not much. i got a really nice set of heads I ported and have done for it. Well, and that's the car you're building now. Yeah. You're kind of finishing that car now. So yep. that's the car you'll be here in October. Yep. For my one crazy right. weekend, I'm you want a good time. It's yeah. going to be, a, it's and I'm debating. Be a my time. wife says you're going to drive that. She goes, why don't we just trailer it? And I go, ah, I don't, I'll, I'll think about it till we get there. So, well, you know, my 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 thought always is, 
because I go over this with my brother. Now, my brother doesn't have a Dodge Ram with leather interior to tow a car yeah. at 80 miles an hour down the highway or listening to satellite radio. And there is, there's an aspect of fun to driving the original car. There's also an aspect of like, oh, this is going to be a long drive. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then the fear of something like, what's that noise? And, you know, right. all those things that we do when we're driving our classic vehicles. I love to do it. I love to do it when I have the time. And when the drive is an experience, yeah. you know, so. Well, it's no experience driving from Phoenix to here. No. It's just all it's ugly. Not, yeah, it's, it's, it's. So we'll, we'll probably trailer it and enjoy it while we're Yeah, here, you know what, so. but that's what One Crazy Weekend's about. It's a driving event. You know, yeah. you get here, there's a strip cruise Friday night. There's a little car show Saturday, and then Saturday night's the poker run. Yeah. And it's, I'm telling you, every year it's doubled in size because people love coming to Vegas first of all and if they can come to Vegas and you can park your car and it's in a secured space with 24 hour security and you got nothing yeah, to worry about yeah. shoot you're having a great time no, well that'll, that'll give me the motivation to finish things up but I've got the interior the door panels are done everything's I got it from that gal in England called redhead upholstery yeah she does a lot of the interiors over there and beautiful. she does like cow look style interiors. she did a beautiful job on this man it's uh it's gonna look like it stepped right out of 1975 74 yeah and uh, i'll have the dual carbs and everything and i'm i make all my own exhaust and everything so but it's got polished brms on it and so you've been staying pretty busy with the fabrication you know off and on i do um being diabetic i have to stay physically active it helps me keep my sugars under control and uh, i've all always loved tree trimming so we started this business trimming trees my daughter says what are you trimming trees for i says well I don't like going out and jogging or, or, you know, pumping iron. I could lift weights, but uh, it just keeps me physical and it helps me keep my blood sugars where they should be. So um, I have to do something because most people who have diabetes will die from right. complications if they don't take care of it. So, um, but I could stay as busy as I want with the metal stuff. No, I can imagine. I, mean, I have people call me. Um, I'm just kind of parking it right now while I get this other thing going, but I'm working on my stuff. So yeah. No, that's good. I mean, I actually just did a deck lid for uh, Tom Kenny of Hot VW. So. Oh, did you? Yeah. 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 Well, that's cool. Yeah, that's. I mean, with the the deck lid fabrication, how long does it take you to fabricate a deck lid? Well, it's if about thirty looking? thirty five hours because I mean, I literally start. You know, I clean the deck lid to bare metal. I start. I don't. I like to have a blank canvas. I lay everything out. I'm real meticulous, and then all my pieces. I probably got about ten deck lids worth pre cut, um, and then I have to hand shape all the the eyebrows. And uh, by the time I put it all together, TIG weld it, finish it. And they're pretty close. You don't have, you know, you have to probably do a heavy high build primer, block it out, you know. And, uh, but they're, it depends on the deck lid they send me. I had one guy send me a deck lid that was, uh, I actually ended up using one of mine. It was like an ashtray. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was, I just said, you know what, it's not worth my time to fix his. I can fix it later. I just grabbed one of mine and did it. Right. So, but. Yeah. So now you got the. So this is a '62 that you got at the it's house. '65. The, the one with the sunroof. Yeah. Oh, my okay. daughter put the sunroof in it. All right. Nice. I guess she bought it with somebody put the sunroof in it. Okay. And it's not. They didn't do the best job, but it's. Dina straightened it out. And it looks nice. And then I bought all the nice stuff for it. It's got a nice steering wheel and door handles. Yeah. What's your steering wheel of choice? Uh, what was this? Some company. My son-in-law bought one for his van. It's a 15-inch. I'd have to send you pictures of it. I don't even remember the brand. He but bought it, so I you're not one. committed to like it's got to be an MP or it's got to be this. Not be at that. all. Not yeah. at all. I, you know what's funny? I've owned a lot of that original MP stuff, and some of it was okay. Some of it wasn't. Yeah. So. Not a big, not a big fan or collector no. of that stuff. I'm after the look, the overall look. I'd rather have a quality piece. And, uh, I do, you know, when I when I read about the red chop top, I was negotiating the car with the guy, thinking like, well, do I really want the real BRMs? Like, it's a lot of upkeep. They're yeah. magnesium if they break. Like, and I thought if I can get a good price knocked off for the BRMs, and then I said, if you give me the car for five thousand less, no, he wanted sixteen grand for the car. I said I'll take it for ten grand without the BRMs, and then I just kept thinking about it, thinking about it. I said no. I'm buying the car for history's sake. I yep. got to have the real beer. Yep. And I'm glad I did because it wasn't but four or five months later that Eric Lucier sold that set of BRMs for 17 grand. So yep. I thought, well, that just changed yep. the market. Yep. So, you know, what can, what, what, what can you do? 
And uh, well, they're not making them anymore. So that's it. And, and now I'm glad. I, now I'm glad I got them on there because it's just one more thing on that car. The one thing that that car is going to get that it doesn't have right now, it's getting the original stereo back. And that's the stereo. That's the speaker box that was in the magazine with it behind you. And uh, it's going to get. I've got a Berg five speed coming for it because yeah. that car now with that supercharger, I just run out of transmission because it's a. I think I don't know if it's a close ratio box or just a really stock box. But Could be a four thirty seven. They they weren't real tall. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, no, I've I've still got a couple builds left of me. I've got one build that I'll have to send you pictures of as it progresses more. But it's it's a major undertaking metal wise. So. But you've always been a Type One guy. Never Type Three. Never buses. Never. You know, stuff. I've owned a couple buses. I've had a couple bay windows. I had a Vanagon that I built for the Buggerama. I don't mm-hmm. think I sent you pictures of that. Yeah. Did I? Yep. <clears throat> it was an old tan and orange window bus, and. Uh, I needed something to advertise bugging around with. So I built that, that all the metal work on that. It's all metal. Oh, you did all that? Yeah. So um, when I sold it, the guy that bought it, he's looking around. I sold it at Pomona. A uh, guy walked up and he was like seven foot tall. I go, you can even fit in this thing? And he sat in it and he's like, <laughs> he goes, I got to have this thing. And he looked inside it and he goes, did you do this? And I go, yeah. And he goes, this isn't a factory, but I used the factory bumpers on from Europe. I bought special bumpers, um, but all the metal work. And he he looked at that and he says to this, he'd drive it places and people would say, "How'd you get that imported?" Because they'd import them to Canada, right? But you couldn't get them in the U.S. And so, and now a guy named Greg Sayers owns it in Colorado. He's a transmission builder, Mr. Gas. And I met him at the last Phoenix Buggerama. And he had driven it there, and he put a water-cooled turbocharged 2.5 in it, I think. From from like a Subaru? It, no, it's a VW. Oh, is 2. it really? 5. It's an upright motor. And uh, it fit in wow. there pretty good. He did a nice job on it. And he says, oh, man, I, I cruise at 80 miles an hour down the freeway with this thing. But yeah. it's still got my same wheels on it and everything. So, wow. no, wait a minute. He changed the wheels. Somebody took the wheel. Because I bought Mercedes some type of Mercedes wheels because they had the five on one twelve volt. Right, pattern. right. It's so. like a it's like a five star. <clears throat> yep. But well, man, Rick, you got a lot. You've done a lot. You've been around. Uh, still going at you, it. You've been around. You're still going at it. I, I love it. I'm looking forward to seeing the new car you get built out. Hopefully, you have it up here in October for our show. Yeah. And uh, anything else before we wrap up? You think? You know, I I just wanted to plug my daughter. She's uh, she's the son I. My son's a great guy. He's, <laughs> I don't want him to get upset with me. He's he's got a family of six. He's a very successful dentist. And but uh, Shanna became the one. She was called the VW Queen in high school. Yeah. She wore VW earrings, shoelaces, she loved T-shirts, and she used to drive. I had a chop VW thing, you know, a little teeny tiny front window, and she's with uh, Jack's. What were those Jackman wheels? Yeah, the yeah. White five star wheels. And she'd get up and drive that thing to, you know, seminary in the morning, then to school, and it would be like 55 degrees out. But she had her little skirt on, had had a bikini top, not a real top. Right. And so she became the VW person in the family. And she's, man, I'll tell you what, to this day. Well, she's on the cover of VW Trends. Yep. I think it's the, the fall, fall issue. Yeah, the fall of uh, 2023. She's got her, you know, Betty the Riveter or whatever. Rosie right, the Rosie Riveter the look. Riveter, yeah. Um, and but she's hands on. She does. She's a really good painter. She, yeah. She was going to University of Cincinnati to get her doctorate. Um, there was a guy there named Rick Sheff Scheffler. I can't remember how to say Rick's last name, but he was a Porsche guy. He did Porsche Rolls Royces. He had a shop uh, right in Cincinnati, and. I said, well, fine. her Volkswagen broke down. She had a 66 bug while she was there. But to keep her sanity, she restored this bug while she was doing her senior year in medical school. Oh, wow. And Rick let her keep it in his shop, this little 65, 66 bug sitting in the back with all these Porsche Carreras and you know Rolls Royces. And uh, when, we, when I went out there for the first time and met Rick, uh, he took me back to shore, and there was a, a De Tomaso Mangusta sitting right behind her car in the back. It was all dusty. I mean, oh, these wow. are the type of cars that were in their shop. Anyway, so he let her use the paint booth. She took auto body in high school. I thought she just did it to be around the guys, which I'm sure was the motivation. Right. But she actually learned how to paint well. And so she restored this bug, got it almost all painted, and she had like 
a week and a half before she's going to graduate, and she asked me to come if I could come back. Is there any way I could fly back and help her put this car together? So we did like an overhaul and yeah. type thing, and in one week, I had to drill out all the running board bolt holes. Everything was rusted. We put this car together, upholstery everything, and had wow. it on a trailer ready to come home and Rick had guys from his shop that had their Porsches and stuff in his shop that had been there a year and a half <laughs> to come to see if we had finished that car and they were dumbfounded that we put that thing back together. Yeah. But I've got videos on YouTube under R. Mortensen of her painting the fenders and deck lid on her car in his paint booth. And it's it's she's a pretty amazing gal. So Well that's awesome man. I mean it's it's glad that the hobby's caught on with the next generation because, yeah. you know, that's kinda I got my, my kids are car guys, but they haven't, no one's bought a Volkswagen yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm not giving one to them. They got to buy, they got to yeah, get their own. Get they, 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 yeah. Yeah. They got, you got to show me, you show me how bad you want it. You know yep. what I mean? And, uh, but it's, it's just great to be able to have that. My kids are all car guys. They'll, they'll hop in any one of these Volkswagens and drive it around and follow me or whatever the case is. Right. But, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just something that, uh, that, that I've enjoyed. I, I enjoy the hobby. I enjoy the people I meet from the hobby. I enjoy, you know, everything about this little car that could, you know, yeah. and I just think that's kind of, it puts a bow on the whole thing. You know, it's just, it's just such a unique car that attracts a specific type of person that maybe believes the cars have souls. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't well, know. It's like Shannon, when she got married, um, her husband, Kevin was a Harley guy. And I looked at him and I said, you won't be a Harley guy for long. And yeah. sure enough, the Harley's gone. He owns a, he's got a crew cab, they went a crew cab. He's got a convertible Ghia. He's got a Type 34 Ghia. Yeah. Um, now he's got an oval window that he bought at some car show recently. And, and I've done a couple motors for him, but he's full bore into it. And yeah. he's very talented. He's, he had never welded well, I don't think welded much. And when we built the motor for his Ghia, uh, I said, you got to have an engine stand. If you're going to be doing this stuff, you got to pre-run your motors. So one afternoon we converted an old Harbor Freight engine stand into a, or a, yeah, engine stand into a test stand. And it turned out really nice. It's got a dash on it, gauges, tank, electric fuel pump. Yeah, the whole nine. And um, I helped him tack it together and he had just bought a, Eastwood welder, one of their welders, and I showed him a few things. And man, the next time I came back, he had it all welded up. It was all <laughs> together, and re- you know, he had the tank on it and the fuel line. And so Kevin's full bore now too. I imagine they'll come to the show too. With oh, us, that's uh, awesome! Yeah, it's listen. It's a, it's a great. It's a great time, and it's a back to where shows were. Yeah, people that uh, that want to have a good experience at, a, at an event, and, and not just a parking a park and look at car show like an event a weekend event so yeah yeah i'm excited for that it'll be fun I'll well look forward to it rick thanks for coming on yeah, i appreciate it i'm glad we finally we've been we've been trying to get this hammered down for, for a probably a year yeah. i think I mean, <laughs> it's been a while man we've had a lot of stuff going on but no that's great i'm glad we uh i'm glad we got to get this down on record and i'm sure when you get your car out and you're out here for one crazy weekend i'm sure we'll be able to it's, we'll cross paths again and maybe sit down and have another chat been hard to believe because this is for me it started 54 years ago this year that's wild so it's uh never dreamed it'd be this long so <laughs> it was worth it <laughs> yeah no it's it's fun i'm enjoying it it's so. a it's for sure a great hobby and i have a very supportive wife she's you have to i don't know how i was so lucky to find someone like her so yeah someone that puts up with all the nonsense like oh yeah. you're just going to talk to your car buddies for a minute okay yeah. i know what that means yeah. i'll see you in an hour yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So, well, anyway. good deal. Well, thanks for coming on. I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's been fun.